right, so I'm um, here today to talk about the use of information operations, um, not just on social media, like how we've traditionally seen it, um, but over open source communities or open source um, code bases. So to start off, um, I'm Sophia D'Antoine. I'm the founder of Margin Research, a small security company based here in New York City. Um, I also went to RPI. Um, so of course, for those of you who play CTF, um, RPI SEC, um, kind of a big, big fan of CTF as well. Um, so feel free to contact me on Twitter, um, Kelly Quendi, or on IRC or Discord as, as Quend, um, or feel free to email me as well. Um, in the past, we worked at the NSA um, and did a lot of work as well on not just information operations, but um, supply chain and um, hardware and things like that. Um, all right, so that's me. Um, all right, so traditionally, uh, information operations look something like this. So when we talk about information operations, we we immediately start thinking about Twitter. Uh, we think about social media bots, sock puppets, um, trending algorithm abuse, um, hashtags being used to convey specific meaning or idea uh, or to propagate a certain narrative. Um, so you can see in the up, upper left hand corner, we have China here, um, where of course the main language is in Chinese. And you have popular hashtags like Hong Kong and things like that um, used to try and create the narrative that um, you know, maybe anti-Hong Kong or anti-democracy sort of narrative. Um, and of course you get other hashtags as well. And so the main idea of course for a lot of these operations is they want to gain trust in a social network community, um, not just trust but also some sort of um, authority. And so for example you might have a fake account online again, maybe using Twitter or something um, that has a lot of clout um, and maybe is used by the government to push certain narratives. So in Indonesia, what we see a lot happen is um, they'll make fake profiles for uh, their own, uh, not Hollywood, but the movie stars and things like that. And it'll actually be the real person who had created that account and they've uh, purchased it from them. Um, and so that would be something like a sock puppet or something like that. But again, the idea is to push a specific um, political view uh, to push specific content. Um, and this is useful for ideology purposes. Um, and oftentimes what we'll see happen is the same infrastructure is reused for different operations. So um, last year we found that all of the accounts um, tweeting anti Hong Kong content in Chinese sphere of Twitter um, had been used previously to uh, tweet about other topics. And now I believe they're tweeting about um, about uh, supply chain issues and things like that. Um, and in Huawei. So you see the same infrastructure being reused um, for completely different purposes, maybe even by different groups uh, within a government organization. Uh, but the main goal is to push content, uh, to push, push ideology. And so that's what we traditionally think of when we think of information operations. However, we've started to see this sort of um, method actually used in uh, software communities as well. So the idea here is very similar to what we'd see with more of that political ideology viewpoint. Uh, we see people trying to, you know, gain trust in a software community. They're like, oh yeah, that guy knows what he's doing, so he can review those pull requests, uh, things like that. And so you have these people, uh, maybe fake accounts, sock puppets, uh, joining software communities, trying to gain trust, um, and uh, maybe pushing ideas um, about what that code should look like, what features should be added, uh, or even what um, code should pa pass inspections. And so oftentimes we'll see people trying to um, push vulnerable code commits, push uh, insecure patches, things like that. And so the end goal would be, of course, um, how can we influence the code base or the um, products, usually it's code base, I guess, uh, to make it more vulnerable or to make it um, less secure, so I could take advantage of that. Um, and so that's what we see happening in uh, open source communities today. Um, and again, we can see that some accounts are being reused across different projects. So we'll have, you know, one person who has a GitHub account, of course, it's a fake account, um, trying to influence or do different things in different software projects on GitHub. Um, so very similar pattern to what we've seen in social media, but now it's being applied to uh, op the open source ecosystem. All right, so before we take a look closer at this, what we have to ask is, 
uh, what sort of open source communities are we working with here? Um, and so we have a few examples of this. First would be um, last year, no, two years ago now, a senior security engineer at Huawei um, published a commit to the open source uh, Linux kernel self-protection mail project mailing list. Um, so again, open source community. And it called, they called the patch the uh, Huawei kernel self-protection patch. Uh, now this patch was full of like amazingly trivial bugs. Um, and it was actually only found um, out to be buggy because uh, Brad Spangler, so GRSec guy, uh, wrote a blog post highlighting these bugs. Um, and he also notes that while it appears to be a Huawei patch, it was unclear if it was actually an officially, official company product, uh, project or not. Um, so, you know, attribution and intent is always the hardest thing to actually nail down with these things. Um, but at the end of the day, we can see that uh, the mailing list and the security of you know, the Linux kernel is only as good as its community members. It's only as good as the people who are reviewing the commits, reviewing these merge requests and patches. Um, so there's some inherent ambiguity here. And I won't go through all of it, um, but this specific example I just gave, probably benign, unintentional, but it's impossible to actually truly tell. Um, so the, his intentions be behind this patch were most likely benign, um, and, but it, again, it's impossible to tell. Um, and so this really, this example indica uh, indicates how easy it is to contribute to a widely used code base um, and really kind of fly under the radar. So really actually get a lot of um, things done uh, or maybe things pushed through into the code base um, without actually having that many eyes on you. Um, and a lot of these patches, a lot of these commits um, were not really rigorously tested. Um, maybe one or two people review them, not a lot. Um, for the Linux kernel, for example, most of the projects extremely fragmented in terms of community. Uh, so we have specific teams that are, you know, say, okay, you, you're looking at this driver, you're attached to this driver. Um, and depending on how lazy those teams are, a lot of things get, get through um, their security passes. Um, now, a more intelligent patch would have uh, potentially had a well-hidden bug that could have actually had a chance to be um, approved and then committed to release uh, for this Linux kernel driver. Uh, now, just as an aside, I think it's funny to show the code just to show how bad it actually is. Um, it's just it's horrible to look at. Uh, so it's a it's trivial kernel stack buffer overflow, um, basically something you'd see in CTF nowadays. Um, so basically it goes through here, uh, has a stack buffer, copies any length at all from user space into that stack buffer and continues. Um, and the best part is the entire function just returns zero. So the, the function ksg state write is actually not needed at all because the temp buffer that's written, it's, um, that is written to doesn't actually get used later on. Um, so the ironic part about this is that the, the guy who actually submitted this patch to the Huawei um, code um, is apparently a seasoned security engineer um, who couldn't have been bothered to add the most basic security checks for length or you know, even logic checks here. Um, yeah. Uh, then another example, so that was kind of one example of, of what we've been seeing in um, different open source projects. Uh, we are not the only ones looking at this. So a paper out of university, I think it was somewhere in Illinois. Um, so some PhD students thought it'd be interesting to determine um, how feasible it would be to introduce vulnerabilities into open source software projects. Um, now they're calling it hypocrite commits, uh, where we're thinking of it more from an information operation standpoint. Um, but they wrote an entire paper um, and actually uh, submitted real bugs to open source projects, including Linux kernel, um, to see if they could get their commits in, in, uh, actually added to main. Um, now, it's funny because they had to come out, and they, they published this work on Twitter, or not Twitter, in a journal, and then talked about it on Twitter. And they said, hey, you know, we're actually getting success here. Uh, we're in introducing bugs, things are actually going through. Apparently nothing was actually put into release uh, because you know they stopped it before it could, but things were getting approved to be released. 
um, into Maine for a lot of these projects. And you know, they put this out online and they're like, hey, this is really bad. A lot of open source projects that people rely on, we're just able to like add you know, buffer overflows into all of these things. Uh, so why bother learn how to you know, do vulnerability research if you can just add add the bugs yourself to the code? And Twitter just completely uh, skinned them alive. And so a lot of their, they deleted a lot of their tweets initially, but managed to get this one screenshot. Um, and so basically they had to go to defense and say, you know, nothing was really merged, even though it technically was. Um, they were still, they were on the defense here. Uh, but yeah, so basically uh, they were using the uh, bad patch method. So this, you know, they spit a patch that actually fixes a real world bug, but that patch that fixes that bug introduces a new one. And so of course we see this happen all the time. Um, now the interesting thing here is for them, they were doing this intentionally. Uh, for a lot of open source projects and projects out there, um, you know, a lot of people assume like, hey, the intention was to fix the bug. By mistake, another bug was added. Um, and so the real question now would be, how can you tell the difference between um, intentionally and not intentionally adding bugs to code? Um, this you know, happens all the time. Actually, Apple's notorious for doing this. You know, they fix one bug in WebKit and the patch just introduces another. Um, yes, yeah, so that was a good example of that as well. Um, other different open source communities, so Chromium. Um, so Chromium had um, crash reports submitted. Um, basically, TLDR is there's this one guy who is notorious for jumping in on crash reports and basically just messing it all up, like confusing people, saying this isn't a valid crash report. Um, I can't rep reproduce this. Um, He's part of the Chromium community, but no one actually knows how he got that into that position in the first place. Um, so specifically, this is one of my, um, he's referring her, he's badgering one of my employees, David, who's submitting a, um, you know, a bug to, to uh, the Chromium community. And he was saying, you know, I can't reproduce this, this isn't working, um, all these different things. And so one other area that we're looking at for, for this work is, um, not only are people actively, you know, maybe adding intentionally buggy patches or buggy code to projects, um, are people using the kind of the social angle to this and trying to create dissent and confusion, um, you know, warring factions inside of these open source communities where, you know, maybe one group side is right, but now it's a, you know, a political issue inside of this community where if you agree with one side, um, you know, the other side hates you now and things like that. And so you start to see these little weird social patterns emerge uh, that actually uh, trump the uh, um, technical correctness of whatever they're talking about. So, um, you know, what we're really saying here is that people get emotional about things. Um, and so comments like his end up sowing discord um, and, uh, you know, resulting in actions that might actually affect the quality of the code later on. And then finally, we start to see um, an emergence in, and this is related to open source communities, um, but in universities and research centers as well, where, um, you know, instead of, again, having a hundred bots retweet things on Twitter to influence people's opinions, why don't you just stick people into uh, research groups? And so, of course, the hot topic now is, um, you know, China and the U.S. and uh, different, you know, different kind of things going on there. Uh, but in addition to open source communities, there's definitely some evidence to show that right now um, there's also issues in university research communities as well as Silicon Valley um, institutions. So, of course, some of these headlines are sensationalist. Um, but there is something to be said with, um, you know, are people intentionally joining a group with um, you know, good intentions, or are they joining these communities for ulterior motives? Um, and so, of course, there's been issues in the past with um, scientific research being stolen, um, but then also, of course, we're starting to see now different um, uh, influence occurring that actually has real effects on 
um, you know, supply chain, on tele telecom infrastructure, that sort of thing. And so an example with the, of that would be um, the Standards Committee actually for, I'm going to fast forward to this, so I don't have a picture for it, um, for the uh, 5G specifications. So um, the uh, kind of telecom telecoms around the world come together um, every few years and um, basically take a democratic approach to telecom and say, okay, what should 5G look like? What are the specifications for it? Um, and it's very interesting to see who actually shows up to a lot of these events because in a way they are um, open sourcing intelligence from these different companies and saying, okay, like, let's all try and come to an agreement together. So anyone can show up, anyone can voice their opinions. And um, what you see happen in person is very similar to what we see happen in a lot on these social um, networks, as well as these the social aspect of the open source communities, um, where people, of course, um, you know, create factions, uh, pretend to support something, even though they're trying to support something else, um, and that sort of thing. And so, of course, that's been an issue um, and something of kind of prime prime focus going forward as well is the telecom space. Um, but the really main, the main takeaways of this, and I think this is the interesting um, part of this work, is that we need to really protect our open source communities. Um, a lot of people, I think, associate um, inf influence operations uh, with social media. And then, of course, with when it comes to code, we just say, okay, like, let's look for vulnerabilities. Um, and this is really a merger of the two areas of work where, you know, one hand, um, on one hand, we have influence operations, on the other hand, we have open source, um, and that's code, and these are the merging of the two together. And I think what this also shows is that our a lot of um, not security as much, but a lot of a lot of the industry uh, just assumes that open source is secure. Um, the whole there's a whole phrase, "many eyes makes all bugs shallow," right? And what we see happening is that you know maybe that's true to some extent. Um, but when you let just anyone join a community, if there's enough incentive, um, that can be a danger in itself, right? So, for example, with, um, you know, with the Linux uh, kernel drivers, uh, we don't know who actually has the most incentive or the willpower to send a bunch of people to sit in these chats and really affect what the, the Linux kernel drivers look like going forward. And I think this is, um, this is important because open source software is basically part of our critical infrastructure at this point. Um, you know, anything from power grid um, hardware to, um, you know, financial institutions, at some point in there, there is some open source code um, actually being run and used. And I think for a long time, people have just taken advantage of open source communities, um, you know, and no one really thinks about them now. Everyone just says, thinks that, okay, yeah, of course people continue to do work for free, and the quality will be fine, and we'll be able to keep using Linux. We'll be able to keep using, um, you know, Firefox or libpng, um, all these different libraries that are the bedrock for a lot of commercial products. Um, people just kind of take that for advantage. Um, so yeah, besides that, of course, I think research and standard meetings are an interesting angle to look at as well. Um, but what we're really seeing is similar tactics used on social media. Um, are also used on, against people in other communities besides, you know, the Instagram and Facebook communities that we think about usually with information operations. Um, all right, so that is the end of this portion of the talk. I'm going to switch slides here briefly, or slide decks here briefly. I have a few more examples to walk through. Um, but in the interim, is there any questions or? Uh, so far, no questions yet. Okay, good. I'm never, never sure with these like the the remote ones. Um, all right. Okay. 
So um, this is so this that was like the introduction to a lot of the work that's being done now. Um, and what's happened since uh, we initially started looking at this is um, there's a project coming out of DARPA called um, Social Cyber. And this project we start or helped create to uh, literally look at this um, at this problem. And so these are some of the slides that we we talked about or we used earlier this year to talk about some of the initial findings from this um, from this project. Um, so it's called Social Cyber. And again, it's looking at the um, kind of the weaknesses in the social uh, communities around our critical infrastructure, so around those open source projects, around those um, open organizations and standards meetings and things like that that might affect our open source um, projects and things like that. Um, so to start off with, when we, we started to look at these these groups, we've had to ask the question, um, you know, what characteristics, what behaviors should we look at that might seem sketchy, right? And so we thought it'd be fun to uh, um, walk back, uh, kind of let's you know, look at the basics of this. I don't know if anyone has ever read this before. It's hysterical. It's called the Simple Sabotage Field Manual. Um, so this was passed out in World War II, uh, I think by the CIA or someone. And it was for people who want to disrupt a community. So, okay, how do you disrupt a community? Well, these are the simple sabotage steps. Um, and it's funny because you're reading through this, um, and like I said, you have to read it, it's so funny, but not much has changed. Um, the Really, the only thing that changed is how people sabotage each other, like over what mediums. So, you know, it used to be in person or next to a fax machine, and now people sabotage each other on like, you know, in DMs on Twitter and things like that. Um, but some of these are pretty funny, so like, one way to sabotage a group is to bring up irrelevant issues as frequently as possible. Um, or advocate for caution. Be responsible and urge your fellow uh, co-furries co to be reasonable and avoid haste. Um, so basically slowing down the processes as much as possible and muddling up all the bureaucracy to make things just not happen. Um, and so we started to look at these different techniques that people might use um, in a community, um, but then also, you know, that's the behavioral side of this. Uh, we also want to take a step back and actually categorize the different open source communities that we're actually targeting. And I think some of the results from this were pretty funny as well. So you really have four different types of open source communities. Um, so on one hand, you have your corporate overlords. And so that would be projects that, and again, we made up the terms for this, um, projects that, uh, are owned by a large corporation and still run by a large corporation primarily. So of course the Chromium project, even though it's mostly open source and you know people can contribute things, uh, Google puts a really tight hand on that. So Google tries to make sure that everyone, everything that actually goes through to release, you know, to master um, is quality. And so they have a lot of their own employees that they're paying to just sit there in that open source community and manage the open source people. Um, and then, of course, on the other hand, you have, I, I call it the core old guard, uh, but basically it's, you know, you have these guys who are so dedicated to their open source project and they've been around for years. Um, and so, of course, Richard Stallman's a great example of this. Um, GR Security is great at this as well. Um, and so what happens is, you have these one or two guys in these projects who it is their project and nothing is going to get into release unless they've run through that code. And so that example I showed earlier where, um, you know, Brad Spangler discovered the, the Huawei patch was bad and was able to stop it before it got approved. The only reason that, uh, you know, that happened and Linux is still, you know, secure from that is because he literally reads every single commit and pull request uh, that goes through into his project. And so you need that sort of dedication, that obsession over your project um, to really kind of qualify it as this type of project category. Um, but again, that changes the social dynamics, right? So now these everyone in that project knows that these guys are um, kind of the leaders. Uh, then you have projects that are more democratic. So the ones that like, they don't really care if you submit something, they'll just approve it, and push it forward. Uh, Metasploit is like this. 
Um, I want to say Ghidra is kind of like this as well. I know a lot of people can get, you know, whatever um, features they want kind of through there. Um, and then, of course, you have your abandoned projects. So I don't know if anyone's heard of Plan 9. Exactly. <laughs> I haven't. Um, or Python 2.7, where projects that, you know, had a strong open source community around them, people either lost interest or moved on to a different project or whatever. And so now that you can kind of uh, group these different projects and look at the different behaviors of people, um, you can actually perform some attack classification, right? Um, so at the end of the day, attack, attacks in open source communities differ from traditional information operations because there's no trending algorithms to take advantage of. You actually need people to really believe that you're a certain person or really believe you're an expert. Um, so it's all about gaining trust and clout in the community. Um, now, of course, you could create a bunch of accounts and amplify your ideas in a community you know, by having all of your accounts pile on top of a thread and saying, yeah, I agree with, you know, this guy or whatever. Um, but you could also harass people in the community, start flame wars, um, which is in what we saw happen in the Chromium uh, project in that last example. Um, and you can also come and come in through external communities as well. So a lot of times you'll have an open source project that relies on different open source project and so on. Um, so at the end of the day, ownership and reputation are everything when it comes to these open source communities. Um, otherwise, it's just an open playing field. Um, all right, so we already looked at the examples. All right, so since um, the last examples that I showed you, we have found a few others. So I'm sure everyone um, has heard about the drama around Freenode. Uh, so Andrew Lee is the Crown Prince of Korea. He's also a cryptocurrency mo <laughs> mongol. Um, so these two people conducted a hostile takeover of um, the Freenode network, and this is back in May. Um, so like we said earlier, open source software develop development leans very heavily on socially defined boundaries. Um, and so one kind of way that people communicate is on IRC. So um, a lot of the you know, people I talked to uh, who, who used to run IRC um, kind of characterized open source communities as relying heavily on social platforms like IRC, like Discord, um, or um, Bugzilla, for example. Uh, these are platforms that allow people to communicate and actually you know, have some sort of social um, network around a project. Um, and so there's a certain trust that comes with um, having these platforms and a lot of associated risk when you don't directly own or control this platform. Um, so needless to say, when the communication apparatus of a project suddenly collapses on itself, like Freenode, uh, it makes it incredibly difficult to meaningfully respond to any sort of threats to your community. So if something breaks, how are you supposed to tell the other person across the internet that that's his line of code to fix if uh, you can't communicate with them? Um, and so I thought that this was, first of all, it was a pretty funny um, hostile takeover, uh, but also a lot of people use IRC as part of these development life cycles for these projects. Um, and I won't go through all of these, but again, we desperately need to protect open source communities. Um, all right, so um, currently, what are we doing through DARPA's social cyber, cyber program to protect these open source communities? Well, we want to characterize external uh, communities contributing to a project. So that's the classification um, of people, kind of labeling people as you know, a certain type of person or a certain type of contributor. We want to be able to classify organizations within a project. So, um, you know, this team runs democratically and they manage this sub feature in the browser and so forth. Uh, we also want to discover events that disrupt these communities. So what sort of behavioral changes are we looking at? Um, and also maybe uh, tie back contributors to a project to, you know, their real jobs or to um, their past actions in a different project. Um, so what have they done in the past that might influence their current behavior and, um, you know, how that might be, uh, how that might relate to their trustworthiness in the community. 
All right, so to do this, um, there's there's some projects online, and this is a, a coming coming from the threat intelligence side of um, side of security. So there's a lot of neat projects out there already that allow us to handle data. The difficulty is, okay, now we're going to handle an entire Git repo, um, all of the comments and threads, all the Bugzilla comments, um, user accounts. You know, how can we stick all of that data together and really cross-reference it? Um, so the Chaos Project is an open source project as well, actually, um, dedicated to monitoring the uh, community health of open source software. Um, so they're basically building this tool to look at communities around software projects. Um, and that's through Grimoire Lab. Uh, and so an interesting case study they actually have is where they run it against themselves, which is pretty cool. Um, now, it doesn't handle really large projects that well. Um, however, it's pretty pretty nice to start off with. Um, it has the ability for us to uh, classify different communities, um, look at different temporal temporal views of people interacting with each other, um, that sort of things. Um, so yeah, this exists already. Um, there's also a few other um, projects out there. One's called Atmosphere X. Um, it's a high performance um, global social media data search processing analytics platform. So it's meant more for our traditional information operations to look at different media references, geolocation, things like that, uh, different trends and things. Um, but we could potentially, um, or one idea was to potentially apply Atmosphere XX um, to this new domain of uh, open source communities. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting to see that basically we're at this intersection now between different domains. Um, that's pretty novel, right? So there's not a lot of tools in the space um, which are optimized to actually correlate open source repository data with social media artifacts. Um, and so, of course, that's where we come in. So let's skip ahead to this. Um, one of the things we're building, and this is basically the technical approach to the project we have now, um, is we're starting off with, or we're trying to start off with a larger project to analyze. So we're picking the Linux kernel um, because it's very difficult. It's one of the largest open source code bases actually in the world, um, which is awesome. Uh, so if we can successfully analyze this. Hopefully we'll be able to scale things down. Um, but the Linux kernel has um, archives of its Git format, which means we can conveniently use similar queries for older things and stuff like that. Um, and so, I'm going to start off with some uh, you know, source code artifacts, and that's going to be the actual code, the commits, the comments and the commits, that sort of thing. Um, and then we have our social artifacts, which is you know, IRC logs, Bugzilla, mailing lists, um, basically anywhere where people are discussing um, actively de being active development um, of the project or actively developing features, uh, pull requests, bugs, that sort of thing. Um, and so we've all already also included um, uh, Twitter as well, because we see a lot of researchers and developers actually commenting on things on Twitter. Um, like, oh, OK, so you know, this feature be added, that sort of thing. Um, so basically, we have all this different data in different data sources. We need to parse it and then just dump it together um, into one large database um, using different classification um, rules and, of course, the machine learning to kind of try and correlate the different data points together um, so we can stick that in. Uh, dgraph, which is, um, you know, one of the many ways you can vi visualize and analyze data. Uh, dgraph actually allows you to write queries over your graphs as well, which is pretty cool. Um, but yeah, so we're going to start off here and then we're also analyzing or trying to analyze um, different individuals as well to try and use kind of the, the context of their background as well to influence our understanding of their behavior in the current project. Um, so we don't want to find things like angry commits or suspicious commits and that sort of thing. All right, so what are we looking for with this community analysis? And so we have our social um, artifacts. So, you know, people harassing each other, other flame wars, um, other external communities grouping together to try and push a specific feature through. So they have an ulterior motive. Um, and then, of course, we have our source code artifacts, which is what you'd think they'd be, right? So is it buggy code? Um, what are the actual users and commenters on something? Um, are there any hypocrite commits? So, you know, something that says, oh, hey, I'm patching this bug, uh, 
Um, but then when you actually analyze the code, it's not fetching that bug. So does the um, intent described in the commit message um, actually match up with what the actual code says? Um, and so one um, side effect of this is we we actually achieve uh, or we, we um, are able to extract roles in the community. Um, so who are main contributors, occasional contributors, um, you know, drive by contributors. So people who shouldn't really be there, but are trying to add something um, who has, you know, the trust of from being there for 10 years versus who's trusted, but has only been there for a year. Um, and so things like that can help inform us as well what what actually is going on. Um, all right, so kind of taking a look at uh, one example. So shout out to Dave Itell for helping me um, kind of actually analyze all the data. Um, there's a lot of caching issues with DGRAF. Uh, so we want to build algorithms that focus both on structuring content here. Um, so this is an examination of people who um, are committing to the Linux kernel um, on the behalf of the Huawei organizations. So they're doing it for work. Um, and so the red dots or, or the pink dots, I guess, are people. Um, green is commits and blue is the actual file they're working on. And so this shows the volume of con contributions relative to other people um, on the same file, which is pretty interesting. And it shows which files, which features of the kernel are receiving the most attention. Um, and shows us also who is active in the given region. So, you know, one thing that this would result in is saying, hey, these features in the kernel or these features in this project have tons of people looking at them all the time. Um, you know, and from a vulnerability research perspective, you could say these files are looked at so much, there's no way they have a bug in them. You want to look at files that you know, are somewhat frequently updated, but also doesn't have a lot of people looking at them, right? So there's a higher likelihood that those files might have bugs. Um, but that's kind of a side effect of this. Uh, so right now, though, um, this is a very focused view of what's going on. But if we opened up the query a bit, we could observe users contributing to particular regions of code. So not just files, but regions. Um, and so we might want to call out um, cases when people are suddenly switching regions of code. Um, so, for example, if someone is an expert at, you know, network drivers and they write a lot of network driver code, and then one day they suddenly switch to a different area of the code base, that might seem weird. They might have, you know, maybe unintentionally uh, bad code in that new area. All right, so um, now this is kind of flipping it. Who is contributing code to the Linux kernel um, on behalf of the MSI? So I thought this would be an interesting one to run. Because uh, I thought we'd actually get no results. There's results, which is funny to me. Um, but basically, and now this is interesting, I think, between the two. But on the left, you see that this is kind of a separate blob. There's no connections between these two graphs. Um, these are people who are working on um, SE Linux. Um, and then on the right, we have people working on Zen, uh, the Zen hypervisor. And so there's no intersections between these graphs, which is a clear indicator about the type of organizational structure they're coming from. So clearly we can see that all of these people probably do work together. Um, they probably were told, you know, hey, go work on SE Linux. And they're like, okay, heads down, that's what we're gonna do. And these people all work on Zen. And so what this tells us is we can say, okay, you know, at work, they probably also don't really talk to each other. Whereas at Huawei, there's connections between a lot of things. So it's probably a lot of more, there's probably more inner team discussion in our team, um, cooperation and things like that. Um, and then finally, we took a look at um, a few people from the Russian cybersecurity company, Positive Technologies, um, because uh, obviously, as we know, Positive Technologies was sanctioned by the US Treasury um, for their alleged support um, in uh, you know, Russian intelligence and things like that. Uh, so Alexander Popov is a you know, long-time contributor to the Linux kernel. Um, he's trusted in the community, um, but he does work for positive technologies. And so it'd be, it's interesting to see exactly what he's touching, what uh, kind of code he's looking at, um, but also makes me ask the question about, you know, uh, why are people, you know, uh, you know, sanctioning positive technologies, but then still using uh, 
the fruits of their labor, basically, um, which I think is funny. Um, all right, so I'm going to break here, and that is all I have for you guys now. If, there any, if there's any questions, I can take them now. Uh, Sophia, so far no questions, but you can open right now. Uh, just uh, it, it's not a question, but uh, Lily, it's saying that you did amazing presentation that was super cool, and you have a new follower now. <laughs> oh really? Oh good. Yeah, everyone should follow me on Twitter. I need I need the <laughs> I need the support. Um, okay. So let me ask the the guys if they uh, have some questions. Just a second. Uh, pessoal, uh, se tiver algum, alguma pergunta, fiquem à vontade. Uh, Sofia, so there is uh, a delay between the video and the question, so we need to wait a little bit uh, till the people formulate and then I'll post the questions. Oh, that um, makes sense, yeah. Cool. Yep. So you have something more to say, feel free uh, while the people type or thinking uh, for the questions. I mean, yeah, I guess for this is more of just a ramble now, but um, my big pet peeve with this is no one actually gives open source software the respect it deserves, right? Everyone just assumes that it'll always exist and be around and be mostly secure, right? Um, but, you know, they're actually, at, it's at, basically it's an at-risk, um, you know, part of the supply chain, right? So we should actually take more consideration with um, with these communities and actually maybe try and protect them or support them somehow um, instead of the way it is right now where a lot of commercial companies just you know, take the code resell it wrapped in a bunch of other stuff um, and so yeah i guess the moral of my story here is that open source software is part of um you know the larger supply chain ecosystem but, Got it. Uh, so I have a question here. Uh, how difficult uh, it is to come up uh, with this amount of data? Oh my gosh. This is the fourth for that. <laughs> that took the most amount of time of all the entire project. Most of the work was spent on data collection, um, which I'm sure if anyone else has worked with large data sets, they have a similar issue. Um, but collecting all the data, they get it to load in dgraph. Um, there was a lot of bugs with dgraphs, like caching RAM thing, where it just would fall over. You know, every time I'm like, oh, okay, I can't add one additional user in GitHub. And then forget adding Twitter data, oh my gosh. Like if you ever, anyone's played with the Firehose um, feature for Twitter, it's too much data. It's like, <laughs> I don't need this much. I, I can imagine. So yeah, quite, so, quite oh, I was hard. Just say, like it's easy to know what you want to collect for data, but then it's so hard to actually collect it in one spot. Like that's, I don't know. Good. Not a big data person. <laughs> so, pessoal, mais alguma pergunta? Just to wait a little bit more. So also Lily asked before uh, about uh, what are thoughts uh, to fix these gaps uh, against these attacks uh, on the open source community. But I, I guess you answer it uh, with one slide. But feel free if you have something more to add. Yeah, defense is a tough question or a problem here because I think it's the same problem that social media giants are facing as well right now where, you know, you don't want to stop legitimate weird use of your platform, right? Because there's a lot of weird people out there, but how can you actually filter, you know, legitimate attacks from the weird people without, you know, <laughs> without killing the your platform? Um, yeah. So, yeah. Because like with open source, uh, you have some guys who legitimately are like <laughs> really trying to help, but they're actively not helping. Uh, got it. Uh, yeah. One more question. Uh, they are asking, uh, what was the scariest thing you found? Honestly, the scariest thing I found was just how many uh, 
and I think so. The results are going to come out from this this um uh, in a, in two months from now. But um, there was a group of people who had um, we're all we think they're all similarly basically the same sock puppet um, in the Linux kernel, like the same type of same creator of all the accounts basically, and they're going through and basically um, creating hype around different. If there's like two versions of a, a patch or something like that, they'll create hype around one. And they've done this now about like a dozen times, we think. Um, and we're not entirely sure, to, even just from reading the code, what the end goal is. Um, but there's something definitely um, fishy about it. So we're going to release some data around um, just the account communication mechanism and like how we could determine they're basically all the same person running these accounts. So we're not sure. Um, and I think that's the scariest part here is we don't know what the end goal is yet, um, but they're definitely doing something fishy. So. It got it. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, I guess we don't have questions anymore. Uh, if they have something, I will gonna ask them to, you know, uh, follow in Twitter or, you know, or LinkedIn uh, to talk to others. Yeah, that works too. Yeah, and I'll address the, the, the questions too. So